Uh, I am Prasanna. I am the CTO and one of the co-founders of Ergata. So today we'll be talking about um, where we came from, uh, why and how we adopted Bazel, what we like about it, what we don't like about it, uh, and lessons that we learned along the way. But just to get it out of the way, it isn't, uh, isn't Bazel supposed to be for large-scale code bases? Yes. Don't most startups have small code bases? Also yes. So why did we do this? What would possess us to try such a thing? First, what this talk is not. Uh, this is more a talk about organizations, process, and philosophy than it is a technical guide for how to do things. There are many of those. You'll hear a lot of them at this conference, but I think these uh, are you know, a little bit more uh, you know, different, perhaps. So first, who are we? Ergata helps you build a fitness routine by turning it into a competitive game. Our flagship product is a rowing machine with a 17-inch tablet connected to it. But don't think Peloton on a rowing machine. Think Mario Kart on a rowing machine. More generally, think of us as a game studio for fitness. We were founded in Brooklyn, New York in 2019 by me and two of my former colleagues. The team is 30 people with product and engineering comprising 17 of that. So what we deliver at its core is an Android app to our customers. Through this app, they work out uh, and connect with the community. Within it are games written in, Kotlin using the Android Canvas APIs, C and C++ using OpenGL, uh, and C Sharp using Unity 3D. This app communicates with the back end written in Go, uh, as well as with companion apps for iOS and Swift written in, respectively, Swift and Kotlin. We weren't using Bazel initially. We were using the default set of build tools for each technology, right? So Gradle, Go build, Xcode, CMake, uh, the latter of which being the default for Android's NDK integration. So we started the company with a many repo setup, mostly because I hadn't worked at a company doing uh, mono repo in a polyglot context. Uh, and at the time, it was just two repositories, right? One for our Android front end and one for our Go back end. But it evolved over time. We had infrastructure management with Terraform. We had a C repository for our OpenGL game. Uh, we had companion apps, right, but then iOS and Android. Unity 3D repository for that game. Data modeling and transformations for product analytics. Uh, and then cross-platform drawing library. These ended up intertwining, right, in ways that we expected and didn't expect. A lot of you are probably familiar with the struggles of keeping the Proto-C version up to date and aligned. Um, but one less obvious context is Kotlin. Kotlin is not just an Android language. The, the Kotlin can compile to native code, including iOS. Now, there are many instances where it's simpler just to duplicate a data model in Swift and call it a day, but there are also cases where having a shared library makes things a lot easier and more straightforward. Achievements and milestones, for example, are common in games and habit formation. We want to celebrate those. And we want to do it consistently across platforms. We want to get the flourishes just right and control the drawing across different APIs. Kotlin compiles this drawing library to the platforms we need, including to native iOS frameworks and to JavaScript. So we ended up with the patchwork of solutions to make our poly repo setup work. Our drawing library was a submodule of our Android apps, but then we would generate an XE framework to be committed to an iOS repository. Our Unity project would be a sub-module of our main Android app, but then with an extra step to export that as an Android library that we could depend on. So we'd occasionally end up with version drift, not just of tools, but also of these internal libraries if someone didn't export the build correctly or forgot to update the sub-module reference. So moving to a monorepo had a lot of benefits just off the bat. But why Bazel? So I haven't really answered the main question, have I? On our team size, our entire software engineering team is 10 people, including me. So at that number of technologies that we're working in, 
everyone kind of has to work across a few different stacks. So you could have someone making, for instance, an Android app change, a protobuf change, an iOS companion app change, and a go backend change all in a single PR, a combination that has, in fact, happened before. So this adds a lot of additional strain in making sure build, things build and test correctly locally. It adds strain in people floating across different parts of the code base to understand how the different build systems work. It adds strain in CI to understand what to build and test. Right? You get a lot of false positives when you test too much uh, and, and you know, just waste a lot of time. Then you get a lot of false negatives if you, you know, just have path-based detection for instance, and then you don't test something that actually was, you know, would have broken otherwise. Um, but more approximately, we were running into issues with the Gradle uh, about you know, how they do some of their caching and ordering of annotation processors. So the idea was appealing of a build system that valued correctness, played nicely across many different languages and technologies, uh, and gave us tools to reduce foot guns in making sure the correct thing was built. So we started experimenting with Bazel in mid-2021. This was mostly a nights and weekends project, uh, mostly by me. Go, having the most built-out automation with Gazelle, seemed the most approachable. And it was. The actual conversion of Go uh, and, and the ability, you know, to the point where we felt satisfied happened pretty quickly. The long time between that point and actually going live in production was mostly testing and laying the groundwork for other languages. Um, but we went live with Go uh, in May of 2022, and from then on, the rest of our services were migrated over the course of that year, uh, starting from services with the fewest internal dependencies to the ones with the most. Uh, and so at the end was you know, our sort of flagship app that you know, has hooks basically everywhere. Um, yeah, so, you know, again, just to reinforce the idea that we, you know, don't have a huge amount of vertical scale, right, just over 850 build files, uh, you know, just over 3,600 targets and about a million lines of code. Uh, and when I made this slide, I did not expect to see a few other, you know, Airbnb's code base, for example, to compare this against, but it's a pretty stark difference. Okay, so what do we like? There's a lot about Bazel that's good you know, for everyone, um, and, and our experiences qualify a lot there, but I also wanna talk about what's good for uh, you know, a small company that's getting on board with this. Number one is GCS cache. Having GCS available as a remote cache was a boon to get off the ground. Uh, people familiar with Bazel's remote caching protocol will tell you that it's inefficient. They'll tell you about long latency on time to first byte. They'll tell you about it being pretty easy to get throttled. It's not that they're incorrect. Uh, it's that it's a perfect, you know, is the enemy of the good kind of situation, right? The, the value trade-off in being able to have something that is easy to set up uh, is, is really, really valuable in a, you know, resource-constrained context. Uh, and so we are feeling the GCS pain a bit, but it took a really long time before we started to notice that, you know, that these inefficiencies exist. CI is simple. This isn't exactly what our CI invocation looks like, but it's not too far off. Using stateful runners, which saves on analysis time and remote cache, we can test the entire code base in under 10 minutes. The extensibility of rules is really where we found what we were looking for. Rules Kotlin does not support multi-platform at the moment. Uh, and we're working on that internally, having something that's more native. Um, but you know, for the time being, until we get there, we can still make it work. We can general our way there. We lose a bit of strictness by hosting Gradle within Bazel, but it works. So we have a rule that outputs as an artifact an XC framework that we then depend on directly from our iOS app. And our Unity integration looks fairly similar where we have an internal rule set that exports Unity as an Android library, and then we can depend on that um, as, as a regular DEP from our Android app. Um, we also use aspects file copying rules to copy over, um, you know, so that we can use Bazel 
for protobuf compilation for, for C Sharp. Uh, and that way, Unity doesn't actually need any deeper integration uh, with Bazel. So CI doesn't need to be too fine-grained because we rely on a high cache hit rate to make that work. But deploying things is a bit different. Right? We have external version numbers. Um, and so the strategy of build everything and see what is different doesn't really work as well for us for a couple of reasons. Um, number one uh, is you know, having these versions uh, embedded in. Um, actually, you know, not all the rule sets that we use have support for stamping. And some of that's changing. Some of that is they didn't and now they do, so we may revisit that. But still, just the, the extra added work of us determining ourselves what has changed rather than relying on a tool to do it for us, just add additional overhead there. Uh, and so on main, Basil diff runs, tells us what changed, and tells us what needs to go out to staging. Uh, and so then, you know, the actual work of doing that becomes a lot more straightforward for us. The Slack group. We would have had a lot more trouble getting off the ground uh, if it weren't for getting to know the people within the Slack group. Even just lurking and reading conversations has been incredibly insightful and informative. Version drift doesn't just affect tools that are used to build code within the code base, it also affects more DevOpsy things like Terraform, you know, infrastructure as code tools, deployment tools like kubectl and Helm, uh, app telemetry, you know, tools for uploading native libraries like Firebase. So before, we had tried standardizing using a patchwork of make files, uh, but this was a giant pain. It was really brittle. It was really hard to keep it up to date across platforms. Um, so now those are all in Bazel. Recently, there have been conveniences like rules multi-tool that, that really streamline this, make the ergonomics a lot nicer for, for everyone to use, which is really nice when you know, the DevOps team you know, is, is so small, really. Coverage. Uh, with developers working across many different languages and technologies, um, coverage metrics aren't useful unless they're standardized, right? Because the, the sort of, you know, it's, it's, it's one team, it's one sort of group. So we have one number that we can point to and one command to run to figure it out and update it. What don't we like? This is basically our experience learning anything new. It's not to say that there are no resources. There are, but they cover the basics. After that, you are basically pointing to reference documentation, which is helpful once you understand enough to understand the reference documentation. But there's a big gap there. Uh, and so there's a lot of trial and error. There's a lot of asking around in the Bazel Slack group or seeing what conversations have happened in the past, piecing things together. Uh, in some cases, I've learned more about how to work with different rule sets by uh, diving into the code and debugging a specific problem rather than reading the documentation. The teams and people who are working on IDE integration are doing amazing work. This is not a judgment on, on the quality of any of their work, but it has been a tough barrier for us to cross. Uh, it's something that the more experienced team members didn't really feel as much, but it was those same team members who were laying much of the groundwork anyway, and so we had uh, a huge blind spot for this uh, and, uh, and miss a lot here. So when we were importing our projects and lost UI previews in Android Studio and Xcode, or when VS Code didn't recognize proto imports in Go, or when IntelliJ gave us red squigglies because it didn't recognize the Android data binding dependencies, we didn't think it was that big of a deal. But our less experienced team members hadn't worked in an environment where they couldn't use those IDE-like features. Um, and to be clear, this is not a judgment on them. This is not uh, you know, kids these days. Modern IDEs are amazing. They're making us all better at our jobs, and we should use all of their features. But it's a bitter pill to swallow when your sense of your job effectiveness is based on being able to use these tools and they're taken away from you without having a clear line of sight as to uh, how to resolve them, when they'll be resolved, or what to do about it. 
Uh, and so for us, we ended up actually forking the, um, the IntelliJ plugin for Android Studio and building Compose previews ourselves. Um, we built it off the, uh, off the work that was started over at Uber. Um, but this was, this was the way that we were able to meet our developers in the middle was to, you know, was to put in our own effort into making sure that everyone felt comfortable and everyone felt able to be productive uh, on this tool. So how to make it work at a small organization? Number one is to have a champion. You want someone internal to help onboard, answer questions, to guide other team members, and take on some of the grunt work. That happened to be me for Ergata. It doesn't have to be the CTO, but it does help. Trying to focus on the good enough, you have to get scrappy. For instance, our build servers that do all of our CI, that run all of our builds, that deploy all of our releases, are basically a Mac Pro and a Linux workstation in the utility closet of our office. It doesn't scale to the size of a large company, but you aren't the size of a large company. You don't have the security of a large company. You should be more concerned with getting to the point where things are good enough, uh, and, and you can trust that if you get to the point where you need ephemeral CI containers in the cloud, you will have good problems on your hands. Document, document, document. But focus on guides. Build files are pretty readable. You don't really need to onboard people to the syntax. But what your team needs are answers to questions like, if I want to make a unit test in Kotlin, how do I know if that should be a JVM test or an Android local test? How do I find the Maven dependency that a particular import comes from? And what is a bootstrapping process for getting a new dependency into the code base? The community around Bazel rule sets is great. The focus on decoupling rule sets from the core code base has some good knock-on effects. Each individual rule set is smaller and easier to understand. Maintainers of these rule sets are generally easier to reach. They are more motivated to make their things work. Um, and you're able to contribute more easily. So going back to one of the previous slides, uh, contributing to the, to the community is good for the community, but it's also good for yourself. It's also good for investing into, um, you know, making your organization more autonomous. So, if I could go back in time, would I go down the same path? Yes. I think we get a lot from Bazel. It's a tool that we can invest into. The more we invest, the more it unlocks for us. And this is a virtuous cycle that uh, is ultimately beneficial for us. So how would I do it again? Sell first. Uh, get team members to understand that there will be workflow changes to work through and sell them on the benefits up front. And this is different from selling into leadership. I think that is already well understood, um, you know, how, how to get leadership on board with this kind of a change. But selling to your team is ultimately equally important. More changes are OK if each one is small. When we were going through this process, uh, I had the impression that if we kept on introducing change after change after change, that those would feel like little paper cuts that would add up. And it would probably be a better idea to defer making changes as long as possible, but then make it a giant change. I was wrong about this. Uh, it would have been better if we had made smaller changes more incrementally um, and, and, and given people time to adjust. Uh, on that point, start earlier, roll out later. This is tough to do as a small company because uh, you know, one of the most things you're constrained by is time and resources. Um, but ultimately, there were a lot of things that we ended up going back to after we had learned more about how uh, you know, how Bazel works, how, you know, what are the sort of ADMs and patterns uh, that, that we would have done differently and ultimately um, save time on in the long run. And then Gazelle. Gazelle is amazing. Um, people want help, you know, 
it's, it's, it's not about build files in the syntax. It's about where do dependencies come from? How do I format them? How do, you know, some of those things. And so that's where a tool like Gazelle that is able to crawl your build graph and, um, and, and auto-generate these files makes it a lot easier. Uh, and so, for instance, the people who were writing Go found it a lot easier to get up to speed than the people who were writing Kotlin. So different question. If I were starting another company today, would I reach for Bazel? Not exactly the same answer. We are in a slightly unique situation with so many different languages and, uh, and technologies weaving together. Ultimately for us, I think that this uh, is beneficial. It challenges for us uh, in ways that, you know, that I think work for us, and it lets us do things like pull from different game technologies all at once to make an experience that uh, you know, allows for the different variety. But if I weren't working in an environment with that many, you know, with that breadth of technologies, then questions of scale become more important. The questions of onboarding, the, the questions of maintenance, the questions of educational hurdles. Um, and so that's, that's where it's a bit more murky, but it's, it's not an easy answer one way or another. And, and I think ultimately, uh, you know, our, our time with Bazel has, has, has shown us that there's a lot that we can get out of it, even if you don't have the biggest scale code base. Thank you. Any questions? Yeah, uh, thanks for the talk. I'm Shane McIntosh from the University of Waterloo. Um, I'm wondering about like a philosophical question. So you mentioned documenting as like a really important thing because it's a resource that will answer questions that engineers might, might have. But when you were saying those kinds of questions, the elephant in the room is that many developers ask large language models those questions. So how do you convince folks to invest in documentation when there exists uh, a gigantic model that might help? Yeah, that is a very good question. Um, I think some of that goes back to culture, right, and how team members collaborate with each other, right, where, uh, you know, we tend to use LLMs for things like getting up to speed on technologies that no one really has the right answers for. Um, but we also find that uh, given the specifics of you know, having a code base that weaves in so many different technologies, that LLMs kind of fall short in, in the personalization, right? In, in, in being able to understand the specifics of, of the things that you were working in. Mm. Um, and so the, you know, convincing team members to write documentation uh, is sort of a culture question then of making sure that, you know, um, having collaborative, you know, having, having values of being open and collaborative um, really make it simple to then say, well, this documentation will be good both for you to go back to, because in a month you're going to forget this, but also for everyone else, okay. uh, and, and making sure that we all sort of pay it forward. Thanks. So um, I work on a team that's focused on a lot of uh, internal like developer experience things, and you mentioned how getting developer buy-in is very important. Um, I'm wondering, are there any specific features of Bazel or concepts in Bazel that your newer developers had trouble grasping or they got really frustrated with? Yeah, um, I think that one of the biggest sort of new developer questions is generally about the strictness of Bazel. So, and part of this is idiom, right? Where part of, part of this comes from the idiom of, you know, you want faster build time, so you want your build files to be per package, you know, rather than one you know god level build file that builds all your android code base um, you know and that you know that runs into things like okay well now you can't really have acyclic or you know you can't have cyclic dependencies here right uh, or you know where do i put this this file right i would have just sort of 
thrown it somewhere before and now I have to think more critically about where I put it and, and, and why do I have to do that is a sort of, you know, these are concepts that you don't really see talked about in, in you know, if you are just looking at the, the standard Android app ecosystem or the iOS app ecosystem, right, um, where you have to get people more familiar with what are the trade-offs that you get there. Uh, and then, you know, you sort of have to help shape their mental model about what you're doing and in some cases show them, you know, here are all the things that you're getting from the cache. Uh, and, and, you know, isn't it nice not to have to rebuild these kind of things? Actually, I have one since we have a little time. Can you say a few more words about the difficulties you encountered with IDE interfacing? Yeah. So, uh, IDE integration, so for Android Studio, or for Android, we're using Android Studio, um, and we lost uh, essentially all of our previews. Um, both the XML previews and Compose previews. Compose previews because they were, you know, hadn't been supported at all. Um, XML previews in theory were supported, but because of, um, I think some, um, I think that might have been a bit more specific for our code base. Um, you know, we also lost previews for iOS that um, was, I think, a little bit more due to a Firebase linking issue. But again, something that, you know, these were things that worked out of the box before, um, you know, and then with, yeah, with, with VS Code sort of setting it up to recognize um, sources generated uh, as like, you know, Go Proto Library, those were also, you know, a, a hassle to get working correctly. Okay. Um, so in, in the end, some of it requires a bit more like, you know, Someone spending a week with the VS Code plugin trying to understand why it's doing this thing. Um, and in some cases, like for Android Studio, it was we actually need to add code to the plugin to make Compose previews work. Uh, and then for Xcode, for instance, it was wait until Firebase ended up fixing the problem two years later.